Okay, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time we have to study here this morning as we continue in the book of Ezekiel and all the issues that are swirling around in our minds, um, the situations in this world, in our personal lives, um, in this movement, and the truths that uh, we have studied in the past and the challenges we have presently. Lord, we ask that you can help us to sort through these things uh, according to thy spirit and thy providences. Help us to trust in you. Uh, pray for all those looking for truth that uh, participate in the studies and in other studies. We just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can guide and direct them. And be with us now as we open your word together. We ask these things and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Well, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those where it's afternoon. And um, our study here today is a continuation of Ezekiel chapter 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, before we, we jump back into the study, I want to draw some lines and, and show us where we're at in, in how we're understanding uh, Ezekiel 37. So we're going to do this here. <clears throat> now, in, in looking at this as a line, um, first I'm going to look at how we have applied Ezekiel 37 um, to this reform line that we are a part of. So this is rather of a simplification <clears throat> of this, but we have 1989 and we have 911 and we have the Sunday law. Now, the way that we have understood this uh, Ezekiel 37 is there's there's basically two messages or two prophesying that that Ezekiel gives. And, and the first is uh, is this line upon line. And we, we touched upon that a little bit, just dealing with the bones, with the sinews coming upon, the flesh coming upon, and the skin coming upon, that this is a parallel. It's an illustration or uh, that we've used of line upon line, that it's like a medical textbook with the transparencies that continue to lay over top of each other uh, more detail. And that's how we've, we've addressed line upon line. And so uh, we have taken this as uh, the bones with the sinews, with the flesh, and with the skin as really a representation as a line upon line. And this message of line upon line was given us between 1989 and 9-11. And then at 9-11, we have the prophesy, uh, prophesy to the wind. And this would then be the second message. So you could look at this as, you know, this is the first angel's message, and this is the second angel's message. And these are going to lead up to the Sunday law. So um, there's a paper that I sent you by Derek M. Williams. Uh, wasn't technically a paper, it was a letter that he wrote um, on WhatsApp. And I, and I sent it to you in a PDF form. And in there he addresses uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. And this is basically uh, how he illustrates it, uh, being the first and second angels messages. And, and, and this would be a good representation of how we understood this line. Now, as we've looked deeper into Ezekiel, we can see that, that Ezekiel is actually this. The prediction before midnight. And then he's going to have at midnight and the midnight cry, um, both uh, the formalization of his message 
right? This is three days um, from the end of the PBM to midnight. So this is July 18th in Samuel Snow's letters. And this, of course, is July 21st and August 15th in Millerite history. And <clears throat> so one of the things that I guess, and I don't disagree with his argument, because we can definitely see that we can take this Valley of Dry Bones illustration and we could, we could address it and say it's a parallel to the parable of the 10 virgins. But one of the things we see about Ezekiel is since Ezekiel is this movement, but a very specific part of this movement, what, what we call the priests, and, and the priests are a development that occurs within this movement that uh, goes from the first angel's message to the second angel's message, but its primary purpose is a typification of this history from 9-11 to the Sunday law. That is, it's a development of the message that is uh, going to then be presented by a group of people who have developed this message and at midnight in the midnight cry, this then becomes understood or its purpose becomes understood. And we can see that with Samuel Snow's letters, that he writes these letters, but it's not till Boston and Exeter that these, this development of knowledge now becomes accepted by the group of people uh, that, that we, we would call the Millerites. And in our line, this would be the Levites. So the Levites and the Millerites are paralleling each other. And here, the Protestants and the Seventh-day Adventists as an organization, as a church, are paralleling each other. So, so this idea, then, we can take Ezekiel and we can recognize, even though this is true as the first and second angel's message, that Ezekiel himself has this prediction before midnight, this development of truth, of which he is a sign, that is everything that's happening to Ezekiel is a sign. And Ezekiel, um, who is us, has this personal experience that's going to typify this, right? So that's, that's the argument that I've been making for quite a while about who Ezekiel is, that he's us. He's also Samuel Snow. So if we're going to say that this is Ezekiel, remember now with Ezekiel, we have taken this line, and, and so I'm going to try to now put Ezekiel on a line in, in a certain sense. Now, we, we tried doing it earlier, and, and my, 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 my observation was that we couldn't really put Ezekiel upon a line, upon a reform line, in the way that we had tried to back in 2016. It is... There was things that weren't working, and I'm, I'm not sure what the solution is to it. But if we were going to place different things on a line, what would we place from the story of Ezekiel? What would we line up with the Sunday law? Destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, so this would be the destruction of Jerusalem. So we have the destruction of Jerusalem, and we would line that up with the Sunday law. Now, we also have the siege <clears throat> of Jerusalem. Now, we, we've discussed it at, at various times, and we, we weren't really sure where we should put it. Uh, but if we were going to place the siege of Jerusalem somewhere, what are some options? Would that... Uh the the siege being more midnight than midnight cry okay so you know so that's the question because part of the problem we have with ezekiel is where is he starting right he's starting at midnight right so okay. <clears throat> so in one way you could say ezekiel is starting here and and, and this midnight and he's going to be predicting uh, the siege. So I, I'm just going to put Ezekiel 1 verse 1 here, 
and then I'm going to put uh, Ezekiel uh, 24 verse 1 because that's the siege. <clears throat> now, so so we could do this, right? We could we could say that this is where we would place Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel 1 verse 1, 24 verse 1, this is going to be the siege. Now, the destruction of Jerusalem is not directly um, uh, dated in Ezekiel, right? He, he gives you uh, some prophecies just before the destruction of Jerusalem and prophecies after the destruction of Jerusalem. Specifically, here he's going to say, um, once the escapee comes, uh, then you're, you're going to be dumb until then. So he has this period of dumbness until the escapee comes which is in 33, uh, chapter 33, that that happens, you know, five months or whatever after the destruction of the J Jerusalem, six months after the breaching of the walls. So, um, so in trying to place this, what, what we have done with Ezekiel then is we've taken these verses here. So I'm going to put 33, uh, verse 21, because that's the one that gives us the date. And... And then we've had this period here uh, where we're going to have this restoration. So we're going to have restoration. And in this restoration, what we have seen is the symbolism uh, is actually going to relate more to things like the close of probation, um, the time of Jacob's trouble, and, and ultimately lead to the second coming. So... Um, so, so we take all of these chapters, um, chapter 34, 35, 36, all, basically all the way through to the end of Ezekiel, are all about this, this restoration and that you're going to see, uh, um, you know, the resurrection of the, the righteous. You're going to see the time of Jacob's trouble, of course, because you're going to see um, Edom and Israel and these two contrasting uh, images are really bringing us back to Jacob. And then, of course, we're going to have the resurrection here in 37. Now, we also have the joining of the two sticks, and we also have, um, which we haven't studied yet, and, and then we're going to have Moab, or not Moab, uh, Gog, right? So Gog, which ties us to Gog and Maid, Gog in Revelation, um, which is these armies that come around and surround Jerusalem after the second coming. So, I mean, I could even put more things here. I could put, you know, the thousand years there, um, the great white throne judgment, all of those things that are still way in the future. And um, we can take Ezekiel and we can place it all in this history. Now, the point that I'm making is that Ezekiel, even though he's in this history, he is a sign that is he is he is typical and, and this is this is part of the the problem but it's actually i think one of the things that we that actually solves the problem is that we know that samuel snow is here in his letters but he's also here at midnight and the midnight cry and he's pointing to the sunday law right so he's pointing to october 22nd 1844 which he believes is the second coming. But of course, he's wrong about that. It's just the arrival of the third angel's message. And, and of course, these are the events that are going to happen uh, in the future. So the close of probation happens, the shut door happens, but this is going to be a proclamation of a message of the third angel's message. Now, when you're looking at Millerite history, and then we came to understand that the parable of the 10 virgins is representing the first and second angel's message. And that's what's repeated in our history, not the third. The third arrives, you know, way back here in 1844. And um, so we're under the proclamation of the third. All this occurs under the proclamation of the third. And this first and second angel's message is being repeated is so that at the Sunday law, the third angel's message can be empowered. So now when we look at Ezekiel, we see Ezekiel beginning at the symbol that we have for midnight, which 
is in the line of the Levites that's paralleling Millerite history. And so we see Ezekiel at midnight. We don't see Ezekiel starting back here. But of course, with Samuel Snow, we see Samuel Snow is here, but he's also here. So what I'm proposing is that when we understand this, this is where Ezekiel is, is historically, if we're going to line it up with this. But Ezekiel is typifying what's going to happen. That is, even though he's here historically, he's actually back here as a symbol. That is, when we take the symbol of, for instance, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 would be over here, right? Way at the okay. end. But now we're saying we've applied Ezekiel 37 here. That is, this movement has taken Ezekiel, and instead of placing Ezekiel over here where he is, we've actually placed Ezekiel back here. Does that make sense to people? I, uh, of what I'm doing. Okay. It, it has an interesting application, but it's going to take some time really to wrap your head around. Right. It, 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 it does take some time to wrap your head around, but we can see in this movement, we've taken Ezekiel 37 and we've placed it here at 9-11. And actually, okay, right. not just 9-11, 1989 to 9-11 and onward, right? So we've taken it as a repeat of the first and second angels messages. So we're, but, so we're looking at it as, as a period, not a point. Well, and it's not so much that it's a period and not a point. It's just that if we took Ezekiel 37, as we've been studying it, we would take Ezekiel 37 and we wouldn't place it at 9-11. We would place it way over here because this is the resurrection. Now, of course, we're using it also as a symbol. So remember, we talked about how there's these different levels in which we can take it. We can apply it to the individual. You know, I'm going to take the stony heart out of your flesh and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, right? We, we can take those illustrations of this restoration and we can apply it on an individual level. And then we can also say, well, this is a reform line. And so where we have placed this in our reform line is in this history. But if we really think about it, if we think about what this movement is, if this movement is Ezekiel, this movement is typifying what's going to happen on the big line. That is, that's what the priests are doing. They're, they're typifying something. They're a development of a message, what we would call a prediction before midnight. It's a development of a message. And this development of this message is also preparing a people. So there is a people that have to accomplish a task and we've called them the priests, and we've got that from Ezra uh, 7, right? And, and, and we could also apply it to Ezra 8 as well, uh, because the call for the Levites and so forth. So, so what I'm proposing is that we're not wrong to place Ezekiel 37 here instead of way over here, because we are Ezekiel. And, and what this is, we're the children of 9-11. That is, this message of this time of the end, the repeat of the first and second angels message, is about this movement. And now, they are a tie to world events. So even though it's about this movement, world events have helped us understand uh, who we are, and when we are, and what our work is, because we know that we're the priests and we have to give a message to the Levites. And so we, we can look at Millerite history and we can say that we're not the Protestants and we're not the Millerites in, in that sense, that this movement was something separate in that reform line. And, and now we've come to understand that it's Samuel Snow's prediction before midnight that really is the work that this movement is doing. So if you take Ezekiel and you just say, well, he starts here at midnight, then the question is, how is Ezekiel Samuel Snow, who's back here? 
Well, the way that we do that is that we, we recognize that Ezekiel is a sign and that his personal life or his personal experience, all of these visions that he has dated, that they line up with Millerite history. But just like this PBM is typifying what's going to happen under the second angel's message, it's connecting the first and the second angel's message. Same with Ezekiel that Ezekiel's experience is typical of what's actually happening around him. And so we can then take this prophesying to the wind and place it at 9-11, and we can know that, that, that we can place Ezekiel here as well. That is, we can place Ezekiel, in a sense, not literally, but in a sense, before the events that that he's a part of. That is, he's typifying something. That is, these events, even though they're real events, remember the destruction of Jerusalem is typifying the Sunday law. So we can take this and we can move it over here and place it into a thing we call the prediction before midnight. Even though it exists and we line it up with here, we need to know that it's typifying that everything Ezekiel do, is doing is really a PBM. And just because we line up this in this way doesn't mean we, we take the destruction of Jerusalem and say that it happens at the Sunday law. Because we know within our movement, we've already taken the symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem and where have we placed it? We, we've connected it with July 18th, right? So even though Jerusalem is the Sunday law, we've taken July 18th as the symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem because of the 10th day of the fifth month, and also a symbol of Islam, the 26th day of the fourth month. And we placed it, we're now placing it before Raphia and Paneum, before midnight and the midnight cry. So <clears throat> what this does is it affirms what we already understood about Ezekiel. But it also helps us in the book of Esther, because in the book of Esther, what do we have? What is the story of Esther? How do we describe it? That happens with, with uh, Purim. The Sunday law. So it's the Sunday law. And what, what's the problem with, with the story of Esther, where it's placed historically in relationship to the Sunday law? It comes before Artaxerxes' third decree. Right. So we would normally take, you know, the first decree, the second decree, the third decree. And if we were going to line these up, we would say this is the first day of the first month, or we could call it, let's call it 9-11. And this is, um, we'll say this is the midnight cry, and this is the Sunday law, right? That's very simplification of, of these decrees and how we would line them up. We could say the first angel's message, the second angel's message, the third angel's message. So we could, you know, refine that a little bit. Um, so, or actually we could even, I, I guess what we should do is we could go 1989, um, 911 maybe, maybe that's better. Um, but anyway, the point is, this is the second angel's message and the story of Esther is here, right? So this is a type of the Sunday law. It's typifying this. Now, when we look at, at the arrival of the third decree then, and we try to say, well, how is the third decree the Sunday law? You know, part of it, our understanding is, is, is recognizing what's, what this is symbolizing. That is what the Sunday law is symbolizing in our line. And so we're, we're going to be going through this again. And we're going we're gonna to see it quite clearly as time goes on. But when we take 9-11, midnight, the midnight cry, the Sunday law, we know that there's no Sunday law on October 22nd, 1844. They're, they're not even understanding the Sabbath yet, right? So the Sabbath isn't even the message. But it's about the third angel's message. And when you look at every single reform line, remember, there's a period of darkness that precedes it, and that the the three-step testing prophetic message that is the reform line 
is addressing a reform related to the darkness that has preceded the first message. And then what you have happen is when you get to the third message, you're going to have a falling away. That is, the third message will arrive, but it's never empowered. It's partly accepted and partly rejected. That is, it accomplishes a certain work, but not the work that it's really meant to accomplish. It doesn't ultimately address everything completely because it needs to be empowered. And in every reform line, we have this failed reform that's going to happen right after in the first generation. And, and then, of course, you're going to have a progressive destruction of four, which leads to a period of darkness, and again, another reform line that's going to come to the third, and then a failed reform, and in the first generation, um, a falling away, uh, a, a failure, and, and then again, you know, it's just going to continue to repeat this cycle. But when we come to our line in our history, and the third angel arri arrives on October 22nd, 1844, we have this repeat of the first and second angel's message that's going to, to have to occur in order for the message to be empowered. And that's going to happen at the Sunday law. The third angel's message is empowered. The loud cry, which I didn't put in here. You got the loud cry in here. And uh, that's going to lead to the close of probation, which for the first time, Michael will stand up and said, let say, him that is righteous be righteous still. Him that's filthy be filthy still. Other closes of probation have occurred, but they've not been the same as that close of probation. So even if you go back to 34 AD with the stoning of Stephen and the close of probation for the Jewish nation, um, it is a shut door. There's all these shut doors. October 22nd, 1844 is a shut door. But you don't have a people that is reflecting God's character that are going to stand through the time of Jacob's trouble stand in the sight of the Holy God without a mediator and experience the same experience that Jesus experienced upon the cross. That doesn't happen except in type. So I know this is a long explanation, but now as we continue to go through this and we look at what Ezekiel is talking about, and we know that we've applied uh, Ezekiel 37 to 9-11, we can see then that this movement is really a typical movement of what's going to happen on the big line. And so this, this, I wouldn't call it a repeat of history. I would call it a prepeat of history. That is, this movement is typifying what's going to happen. And this 9-11 is so important. And, and the attacks that are being made upon 9-11 in this movement presently are very subtle. And one of the attacks on 9-11 is the attack on July 18, 2020. It's actually an attack upon 9-11. Now, you'll see that in the paper uh, by Derek M. Williams, um, because he, he goes through all of the evidences. It's a 10-page letter. Um, basically, just what we already know about 9-11, that Jeff has outlined, that this movement has understood. And if you really understand that, you can see right away when he says, um, and, and he says it sort of in a, a softer way, that uh, July 18, 2020 is in no way a rejection of 9-11. And, and really, he could have stated uh, that, that if you reject July 18, 2020, um, you will ultimately reject 9-11. Now, um, so I, I hope this helps. I mean, it's not complete. We haven't taken, um, you know, how we would take Ezekiel and place him here because we know that there's a bunch that happens in Ezekiel um, that you know is here. But how do we place him back here? We're, we're gonna we're gonna address later on. But you can see how we can take these types. Destruction of Jerusalem is a type of the Sunday Law. October twenty second, eighteen forty four is a type of the Sunday Law. Nine eleven. Um, uh, <clears throat> The story of Esther and what happens at Purim, that's a type of the Sunday law. So we have all these types, and they're not going to necessarily be placed historically where we think they should be. Because what I think this story of Esther is telling us is that this type of the Sunday law actually occurs within a movement under the second angel's message. And so for me, 
when we look at the second angel's message here being repeated in our history, we actually did experience a type of the Sunday law, the pandemic. And that pandemic, of course, happens before the Sunday law. So the type of the Sunday law doesn't have to be at the Sunday law. It occurs prior to it, if that makes sense. So even though we have, um, and, and so even if we want to look at Millerite history, one of, the, one of the issues that came up was that October 22nd to 1844 is the Sunday law, right? That's how Jeff would place it. But yet, we know that if we are going to look at the line of the Levites, that the type of the Sunday law is actually in the second angel's message itself. And, and I, I don't want to confuse people there other than to say that the way that we would do it is we would say midnight is the Sunday law in um, the line of the priests. That's, that's kind of how we, we did it. But uh, so that's 2014. So I don't want to confuse everybody here. I just want you to consider this. So this, this is a proposal. It's not a final solution um, to all of the problems. <clears throat> Any questions or comments on this? I know, you know, there's a lot to process, but anything that jumps out at somebody that we think we should take note of or that I missed. Uh, here, I'll, I'll put it back. Uh, one, one comment I'd like to make about October 22nd, 1844, being compared to the Sunday law. Christ is our great high priest. He obliterates mm -hmm. our sins when we confess and forsake them. Mm -hmm. The papacy, whose mark is Sunday, wants to take the place of Christ, and wants to forgive our sins, mm -hmm. places penalty, penances, all that stuff. There I can see the parallel definitely. Uh, for October 22nd, 1844, being mm. a parallel with the Sunday law. Yeah, and, that, and that's how Jeff has done it. So, you know, I mean, that's that's the, our line. I mean, that's what was given to us. 9-11 is the first day of the first month. Um, midnight and the Midnight Cry um, are these waymarks from Millerite history that are the formalization and empowerment of the second angel's message that arrived at 9-11. And then ultimately that leads to the Sunday law because our message is a message to the Levites to prepare them for the Sunday law because the first and second angel's message of Millerite history that were rejected have to be repeated in our time in order for the third angel's message to be empowered. And the third angel's message is empowered at the Sunday law. And, um, and that's where God's people have to stand to pass their test. Now, it's the close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. But again, it's not Daniel 12.1, and it's not let him that is righteous be righteous still, right? It's a closed door for Adventists. But under the proclamation of the third angel's message, once it's empowered at the Sunday law, is that the message is given to the world, and this leads ultimately to a complete rejection by the world of the Sabbath and the third angel's message, which allows God, on the one hand, to have a group of people that he can say that are righteous to be righteous still, and also another group of people that he can say they're wicked and they'll be wicked still. And so when probation closes and we see the scenes that follow the seven last plagues, the time of Jacob's trouble, the death decree, uh, all these things. The righteous never turn away from their righteousness, and the wicked never turn away from their wickedness. And if we go back to Ezekiel, remember we studied that. Um, uh, I think it was in Ezekiel 18, dealing with the soul that sins, who sins shall die, and it talks about um, uh, you know, righteous people turning away from righteousness and wicked people turning away from wickedness. And then we also ran into that in, um, well, in chapter 33, when Ezekiel is reminded of his role as a watchman and also uh, that 
people basically, uh, you, you're, you're making a choice of whether you're going to be righteous or wicked. So the, so, so he basically repeats that message of Ezekiel 18, as well as the message of Ezekiel 3. So if we now relate this uh, to the close of probation, we can see that Ezekiel is progressing to a point where you come to the close of probation. And, and, and we have that point where Michael will stand up. And, and then we're going to have, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble. And then we're going to have, um, right now, the Valley of Dry Bones, which is the resurrection of the whole house of Israel, right? So all God's people will be there, um, and they're going to be there for the battle with Gog and Magog, right? So, which happens after the thousand years, in my understanding of it. So, does is that making sense to people? Is there... Because uh, to me, it just it's 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 just all coming together in my mind. Hopefully, that's the case with others as well. <clears throat> as you had pointed out in one of the quotes that you used in your article on the last president, new light is going to continue building upon the old light. Yeah. So in this, in this situation, as, as we look at these examples, we can go back to the old light mm -hmm. and we're able to examine it to be able to address whether the new light is conforming with that of the old light and whether it's you know, expanding it or if it's something that, that is just not being placed properly. Mm -hmm. So this, I, I think this is a good start because there's too many things that had been looked at in the past that just didn't line up with things that we were, we were very aware of. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be something that's going to be worthy of more consideration. Well, at least, you know, <laughs> that much well, we can say is true. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm taking this from a very simple standpoint yeah. because what you put on the board is it, it's not overly complex, but it's something that is different in, in the manner in which we have considered it in the past. Yeah, but it's very consistent with what we understood in the past. I'm not disagreeing which with is you. The thing, which is the thing that's so intriguing about it. Right. That, that we knew, we, we can now look back at the past and we can see there's some things we didn't understand fully. That is, like the Millerites, you always think you're further along the line than you are. Right. And, and, and that's part of the repeat of history. And, and that's, that's just logical and consistent. Be, because if you knew where you were, you wouldn't be where you are. <laughs> right? You, you right. couldn't do the things that you're doing. Because part of the role that you have to play has to do with your limited understanding of where you are. And, and believing that, you know, the Millerites, for instance, believed that they were giving the midnight cry in 1843. But it's not given until August 15th, 1844, right? So, so that's understandable. We should understand that about our message. That as we progress through the line, we start to understand more clearly where we are in that line. And But one of the things we can see that we, we see from Millerite history is that when they get to April 19th, 1844, to the end of Miller's message, which really is the first angel's message. And they thought they were proclaiming the second and the third, right? So, because, you know, nobody's going to just say, we're only going to proclaim the first angel's message to, sec to the second coming, right? So when you think you're coming to the second coming, you're going to believe you're pro proclaiming the second and the third angel's messages 
as well. But of course, once they get to April 19th, they realize now that they're in this tearing time and it takes them some time to sort out, to recognize that they didn't proclaim the midnight cry yet, that it's still future. And, and really almost until it's proclaimed uh, at midnight on July 21st, maybe almost nobody had even considered that, you know, where midnight was, right? So now they could say, well, we're tarrying and I'm telling you that it's the midnight right now because we're in the halfway through the tarrying time because it's gonna end on October 22nd, 1844. So, so, so it's very understandable of, of how our movement progresses. And, and, and to me, to go back and take Samuel Snow's letters and to recognize this prediction before midnight as a typification of what's gonna happen allows us to take all of these other lines and recognize that such a prediction before midnight occurs, that is a typification of the Sunday law occurs in each line. And we can see it in the story of Esther, in the line of the three decrees. We can see it in Samuel Snow's letters in Millerite history. And we can see that we've experienced it with the July 18, 2020 prediction that it meets the, the characteristics or the qualifications to be a, tip of, a typical line within the line that addresses the second angel's message that's going to lead up to the empowerment of the third angel's message. And we, we can actually go back and look at, you know, the story of Joseph and because and, Tabo already did it, he already placed the prediction before midnight. And where did he place the prediction before midnight? Does anybody know in the story of Joseph? I couldn't give an answer because I had a, a difficult time watching Tabo's presentation as much as I had a difficult time with many of our members. Right. Yeah. Well, I always had difficulty watching Tabo, but I did watch him and I did read his papers. And the particular point that he made is it was the, the butler and the baker. The three days of the butler and the baker were the prediction before midnight. And, and in a sense, you can go through all these lines and you can find lots of examples in various ways of predictions before midnight that happen um, in, on a smaller scale uh, in each of these reform lines. So for instance, we, we, can we can take the story of Esther, Esther and say, this is a prediction before midnight. That is, it's a type of the Sunday law. But you can also go to the, uh, the story of um, when they leave the river Ahava and those three days there, those are also a prediction before midnight. They're a symbol of it. So uh, these periods of three days um, often are a typical of this prediction before midnight. So they symbolize that even different numbers and different way marks uh, contain that symbol. And even the idea of the 300, Gideon's 300 is a prediction before midnight. So that's another illustration of it. Um, so, so now when we go here, so we're gonna go back to Ezekiel 37 and, and finish off the, the Valley of Dry Bones. And when we look at this, we can say, what is this talking about? And, and this is describing the resurrection of the dead, right? That's, if, if you're going to say, what is it describing? Not, not what is it typifying or symbolizing, but what is it describing? It's describing the resurrection of the dead. And, and again, uh, with Derek's paper, he shows that we have applied it in two phases. The first being the bones coming together, which is the shaking, which is caused by what? What causes the shaking? The wind? It's the testimony, right? So the testimony, the spirit of prophecy, and this what is what happened in our movement from 1989 to 9-11, is this was a revival of the spirit of prophecy in the understanding of it and the application of it. And the use of line upon line 
both in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and in the stories and the parallels that we had. So that shaking uh, causes the bones to come together. And we use line upon line, the sinews, uh, the flesh, and the skin. So we continue with this repeat and enlarge by taking these various lines. But then what happens, what has to happen to these lines to make them understood? What does 9-11 do? Well, the breath is a, a lot of rain. Okay, so early, it's, early rain. Right. Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's, it, well, it's, we, we take it, I guess, as a sprinkle, the first sprinkling of the latter rain. Um, yes. Right, so the first uh, drops of this dew. Um, but it's also connected to the wind, right? So we take Islam, is the east wind, and we also know that we're going to have this restraint of Islam that's going to occur. So the, it's the hold, one of the holds, hold of 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 this destruction that's coming. So 9/11 has a restraint attached to it, but it also has this wind, and this wind is this spirit. It's it's related to the spirit, even though the wind is destruction. Um, but this breath that's breathed also causes God's spirit uh, to come to this movement, right? So, so that's how we've placed it. So we, it, in a sense, it's the second angel's message is this message of prophesy to the wind, right? Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is we parallel 9-11 to what events in Millerite history? August 11, 1840. Okay, so August 11th, 1840 is under the first angel's message, right? Yes. Right, it's actually the empowerment of the first angel's message. But 9-11 serves that purpose. And, and that would be uh, the relationship of the east wind but then we also parallel 9-11 uh, with what other date in Millerite history? The first day of the first month. Okay, which is the arrival of the second angel's message, the rejection of the first. And, and this has always been a problem once we introduced this. Now, we introduced it in that the messages would be combined, um, which in some ways can be a misreading of what Ellen White is saying. Because she just is, is, if you read it at its face, she's just saying, when the first angel's message comes, uh, the second angel's message comes, and it combines uh, with the second, or with the first. So the second and the first are combined. They go together. You can't separate them. You can't just have a first and it ends, and then the second it starts and continues. Um, and in a sense, all the messages combine. So the first, second, and third angel's message, when you read the passage, She's actually saying they all combine, but we don't put them all at the same spot, right? That's not what we do. We know the second is joining the third and the first has to precede the second. So, so we, we've taken some of these things where we say they're combined, but, but they are combined in, in our line. That is, and the reason why they're combined is because when the second angel arrives in our history, it arrives at a point that would parallel both the first message is empowerment because it's Islam, but also it has to symbolize what happened when the second angel arrives because of what's happening with the Adventist church and the rejection of the first message. So, so whether our arguments were necessarily sound or not is not the point. The point is we were correct in how we came to understand that. We can show it lots of different ways. But now, um, when we take this message of prophesy um, to, uh, to the wind, what ends up happening? What, what, what occurs in Ezekiel 37? So let's, let's read this here. So we know that we have this line upon line. We have these, all these, this, this body is now formed. And then in verse 9, it says, he said unto me, then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. 
So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Um, when I have opened your graves, O my people, then she shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Okay, so when we look at, um, at this passage, so again, what is this describing? You know, in the line in the stream of Ezekiel, how, did, how what did we say this is describing? It's pretty straightforward. Just what is it describing literally? <clears throat> the resurrection of the dead. Right. So it's the resurrection of the dead. Did the resurrection of the dead occur at 9-11? No. Okay. So we, we can clearly say that it did not occur. But yet we apply this to 9-11. And why do we do that? Because it's a message that's calling people together. Okay, so a message calling people together. Plus you um, have an outpouring of the latter rain, sprinkling. sprinkling there. Okay, so so we have the latter rain. We know that there's, um, you know, that that's happening. But why would we take this this symbol of the resurrection, or this because this is what this is describing? This is resurrection. Why would we place that as a symbol at 9-11? Because at 9-11, um, you know, we have uh, the church has come to an end in a sense, right? So, I mean, it's more a death. 9-11 is more a death than a resurrection. Um, so, so how do we justify this? I mean, you brought up some ideas. But just think about it. How do we justify the resurrection as occurring at 9-11? You were saying a death, more, more so leadership, I understood. At 9-11, the Adventist yeah. leadership at 9-11 dies, maybe the pass by. Right. Miriam dies, right? You know, if you, if you want to put it that way. Right. The church dies. The woman dies. Um, you know, we might even try to place Ezekiel's wife dying at 9 11, um, but we can place it different places. But I think the way that we would justify this is we would say that this is symbolic. That is, we would take what's in Ezekiel 37, and it's about a reformation, right? So that's how we would, we would take this. We would say, well, this is literally describing a resurrection of the dead. But what is a reformation and a revival? It, is this a reforming and a revitalization of dead bones? Because that's what it is. Yeah, this I, is I would agree with that. Yeah. Right. So, so that's how we took this. We took this and we applied it spiritually. That is... We didn't say that 9-11 was the literal resurrection of the dead. We took Ezekiel 37 and we saw symbols that tied us to our message. Uh, the winds, right? The four winds. Uh, we saw um, the fact that we know our church is in this dead spiritual state. And we took Ellen White's statements uh, talking about Ezekiel 37, what it represents. And that, that we know then that Ezekiel 37 is really a description of a reformatory movement, basically the one that we are a part of. So it's the parable of the ten virgins, which is a reformatory line, and it's uh, 
our present history, which is a repeat of the par par parable of the 10 virgins. And it's describing what our message is to accomplish. Now, but when we look at this and we take Ezekiel, we can see that Ezekiel 37 is really placing this at the resurrection of the dead. Um, whether it's, it's looking at the resurrection of the dead before the thousand years, or actually just kind of in a general sense, both the special resurrection and the resurrection that happens after the thousand years. I think, I think it's here, it's just kind of conflated. It's just talking about the resurrection, um, not distinguishing before or after necessarily, because um, it's not really addressing the thousand years as such. So, so we can see that Ezekiel is placing it in the future, but we have taken this message and we've placed it earlier in the lines that is, we've, we've taken Ezekiel in a sense, and we've placed him as part of this reform line that we're a part of. And we didn't even know what we were doing. That is, we didn't fully understand how that line that I drew on the board, how we have taken Ezekiel and we have moved him over to be us. And, and I think it's extremely profound that we did that without understanding what we were doing. That is, there's no way that we understood Ezekiel um, when we were doing this. You know, Jeff took Ezekiel 37, and in a sense, he took it out of place, out of the context of the chronology of which Ezekiel is addressing. But in so doing, he has actually taken Ezekiel and moved it ahead to match up with Millerite history and with snow. Is that, is that clear? Is anybody not clear about that point or what the point I'm making or has some questions about it? I'm not clear on it yet. I'm gonna to have to study this for myself to understand it completely. Okay. Is there, is there any questions you have about it that come to mind? Not right now. Okay. I will have questions, but <laughs> it's it's just going to take it's going to take me a little bit to to really digest this one yeah yeah and, which is good um you know so the thing is as i've been studying this and and the key was uh, Derek williams paper for me um because i was struggling with this and his just his very clear description of the significance of 9-11 in this movement and the arguments that we use and how we connected Ezekiel 37 to 9-11, it then struck me, you know, what the problem was because I knew that I had to move Ezekiel earlier, but I, I didn't know how to do it. Like I didn't, I sort of had a hint of it, but um, I can see quite clearly that, that this is just the way it is with Ezekiel. He's typifying this movement and, and Jeff had recognized this maybe unwittingly, but in his providence of taking Ezekiel 37, he has done that. Now, there's lots that we could look at. You know, we know all the different ver verses as Seventh-day Adventists, you know, though worms destroy this body and in my flesh shall I see God. Um, I know that I shall stand at the last day um, you know, there's all these, these verses that we have in scripture that talk about the resurrection. And now I studied when I was in university, I studied um, a, a course on intertestamental literature, which was very enlightening because, you know, after Malachi and until we get to the gospel of Matthew, we really don't have um, any literature in there that's part of our Bible. Now we do have some apocryphal literature, Maccabees and, and, and Ezra's and, and so forth. But, you know, and that's what I ended up studying, which was, was really enlightening. But one of the most um, enlightening aspects was studying the state of the dead, how it was understood in the intertestamental period. And the book that I read by Fudge uh, called um, uh, The Fire That Consumes, um, in that book, he really goes through that whole history of all of the writings and shows that the Jews did not believe in a conscious state of existence 
during the time of Christ or any time in the intertestamental period, intertestamental period, and didn't even really have an inkling of it until after the time of Christ, and, and even then very, um, you know, very unlike what we would have now within popular Christianity of, you know, when you die, you go to heaven or you go to the grave, you know, you go to hell um, and are tortured, you know, nothing like that at all in uh, is intertestamental literature. But uh, they do have the idea of the resurrection. And we know that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That is, they just believed that the life that you have here now is it. And the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. They believed that God's people would be resurrected. And that's because the Sadducees, even though you can see it in uh, the first five books of Moses, they really only accepted the first five books of Moses, where the Pharisees accepted uh, the prophets and the Psalms and, and all the historical books as scripture. Uh, it's kind of an oversimplification of, of, of that. But um, there definitely was this difference uh, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees over the resurrection of the dead. Now, here in Ezekiel, of course, we have this resurrection of the dead being used as an illustration. Um, so it's quite clear that the resurrection of the dead was understood in the time of Ezekiel, that it was, and, and you can see this throughout the scriptures, that this idea that one day God will resurrect his people from the graves. Daniel has it, um, Job has it. I mean, there's just lots of different things uh, that we could look at. So as Seventh-day Adventists, we kind of know that. But when we use this now as an illustration, um, as Jeff has done, we can see that uh, and, and Paul does it too, because how does Paul use death and resurrection? What does he use it to symbolize in books like the book of Romans, uh, chapter seven and eight? Baptism. Chapter six. Baptism. Baptism, and which is the conversion process. The old Correct. man dies, you know, he's buried, and you come up to newness of life, right? With the new man, right? So it's a symbol of conversion. Now, Remember what Parminder did. Um, now, he began to do this in, um, I believe it was in, in 2016, in the spring of 2016. He was here in Alberta, and he did a series. Uh, this is really where he began to, to really undermine um, righteousness by faith, and also to undermine indirectly 9-11 while at the same time trying to uh, show that he was supporting it. So in 2000, um, 2006, no, it was 2017. I'm trying to think which, which one it was. It was a camp meeting anyway that I was at. It must have been, must have been 2017. So it was in the winter of 2016, 2017, that he began to to look at 9-11 as um, a symbol of baptism, which is correct. And what was he saying about what happens at 9-11? And this also came out of, of the study earlier dealing with uh, the wheat, wheat and the tares study. So um, might have been 2016. But anyway, how was Parminder depicting 9-11 as baptism? What was he saying about it? Does anybody remember? I think you're going to have to refresh our memories because, again, <laughs> with Parminder, I had difficulty listening to him. Right. So I, can't, I, I can't really give you a, a, an informed answer. Okay. So what he was teaching is that 9-11 was baptism, and after 9-11, we do not sin. Now, this was leading to this teaching that this movement does not sin. Right. And of course, this was a part of the a split that happened with uh, Dwayne Dewey and others who left over what Parminder was teaching. Um, so this movement does not sin was this teaching in uh, 2018. I think we got to that point, 2017 and 2018. So there was there was this development of this teaching or this understanding that was 
um, undermining 9-11. Now, how does that undermine 9-11 when you say that at 9-11, and I'm not saying that 9-11 isn't baptism, I'm not arguing that, but when you say that the movement does not sin, how is that undermining 9-11 when you try to say that from that point on 9-11 symbolizes uh, in the, and he was using um, steps to Christ. Uh, the per- point of conversion has to occur before 9-11 and after 9-11, you just don't sin anymore. How is that undermining 9-11? It's ignoring the three-step testing process because it, it basically says that at with the first angel's message at justification that we're no longer going to sin. Right. And and, and that's not how a reform line works. No. No. And and we know that even though baptism symbolizes the cutting off of the flesh, right? It's it's the same as circumcision. Um that it's actually just the first message and that there is a further refining process that has to go on. There, there's the second angel's message that has to accomplish its work. And then, and that's revealed under the third angel's message where um, it's now demonstrated that three-step testing process is now demonstrated under the third angel's message. So, and it, it, it's also ignoring the whole idea of the sealing, because when we put 9-11 and, and we mark it where, where we mark it, we know that the sealing messages begin, that the, the sealing angel is coming. Now, so if you're saying after 9-11, you have to be free of sin, well, that means the sealing would have to happen before 9-11. So it, it completely undoes all of the purposes that we had for 9-11 within a reform line. Uh, but it was done very subtly. And, and I even supported some of his arguments. Um, and the way that he tried to deal with this is that you don't confuse the individual with the line. Now, there's a truth to that, uh, that the lines represent something and you can't confuse the individual with the line. But if you look at the line itself, the line itself cannot have after the first angel's message that you no longer sin. And so, so there, there's, there's a lot more problems to it than that. Now, one of the things, now we're, I'm just seeing where we are. So we got, we're going to start on the joining of the two sticks. Now, so just kind of preliminarily to that, um, back in 2015, I wrote Jeff an email and I asked him because I was watching a video and he was mentioning the, um, the, the image of the beast test. And I asked him, well, when does the image of the beast test occur? And he wrote back what I thought was a really cryptic email. He just says at the joining of the two sticks. Now, at that time, I was just kind of studying this to try to understand uh, what the image of the beast test was compared to the mark of the beast uh, to the Sunday law itself. And um, so, and even though I knew about the joining of the two sticks, you know, I'd, I'd heard presentations on it before. Um, when he said that, it sparked something in my, my mind in, in that um, I now wanted to understand this joining of the two sticks much more clearly. And what's one of the ways in which we understand the joining of the two sticks? What, what illustration, what uh, passage would we go to in Second Kings uh, that we would use to connect to the joining of the two sticks? It's uh, chapter 21. <clears throat> okay. It's uh, 21. We can start at verse 11. Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah 
that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So how would we address, how would we connect this to the joining of the two sticks? Whatever the 2520 for Northern Israel, whatever they had, it's going to be also applied to, to Judah. There's going to be a 2520 for them. Right. So we have a 2520 for, for Samaria, right, for Northern Israel. And that, and that, that is the, the two 1260s that come together as a 2520. And you're going to stretch over Jerusalem, this line of Samaria. Um, now, dealing and the plummet of the house of Ahab, that's an important point, but I'm not going to go into that right now. But the point is, we take the two 2520s and we overlap them. Now, one of the things I found interesting, when Jeff would always illustrate the joining of the two sticks, he would sort of join them, like put the ends of the two sticks together and bind them. And so it makes a longer stick, which I never quite understood. Because if you stretch one line over top of another, you don't have the sticks, you know, at the ends joined. What you have is you have them overlapped. And, and that overlapping of the two sticks really describes the two 2520s much better. I mean, they're not end to end exactly the same. They've shifted slightly, but they're definitely not, you know, the ends aren't just tied together to make a longer stick. And, and of course it wouldn't even as a symbol really make much sense because uh, the symbol, where does the joining of the two sticks, um, where does the separation of the two sticks occur? So that's, that's the first question. So the joining of the two sticks we have is the two 2520s. Where does the separation of the two sticks occur? Well, the time of uh, Jeroboam. Okay, so what we would normally say is we would, like Stephen has just said, is we go, well, the two kingdoms were divided in 977 BC when Rehoboam uh, overstepped his authority and listen to the young men instead of the old men, and that caused Jeroboam to, to take the 10 northern tribes uh, in rebellion to uh, Rehoboam, who ended up with jo uh, Judah and Benjamin. So, so we would say that that's when the two sticks are separated. And, and then the joining of the two sticks, we would say, well, this is these two time prophecies, these two 2520s uh, that become part of this prophetic mirror. Now, that's not incorrect in, in, a, in a certain sense. But when we go to um, Ezekiel, so we go back to Ezekiel, and we deal with this. We're just going to read this first part. We're not going to get through uh, all of this chapter yet. We'll, we'll deal with that on Monday. Um, but it says, Moreover, uh, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick, and write upon it for Judah, for the children of Israel, his companions. And then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So when we look at these two sticks, what do we have upon those two sticks? What's written upon them, upon the sticks? Judah and Joseph. Judah and Joseph. Now, so... When it says Judah, and for the children of Israel, his companions, of course, the children of Israel, Judah is part of the children of Israel. And so this just means for Judah and those of the children of Israel that are connected with Judah. And then it says, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph. So Joseph is the one that's written on it. So there's Judah and Joseph, where often we just kind of read it as Judah and Ephraim, right? That's, that's right. how we look at it. But for the stick of Ephraim now, we're dealing with the northern kingdom. So it's not just talking about Ephraim as a tribe. It's talking about Joseph. And Joseph is now representing Ephraim or northern Israel. Now, we know that this goes back to um, the fact that Joseph <coughs> 
received the double portion and that his two sons were blessed, both Manasseh and Ephraim. And so Joseph has these, these two kingdoms within the 12 tribes and Levi is taken out from the 12 tribes and scattered, right? So Levi is gonna be scattered among God's people. So this goes back to the blessings of, of Jacob and his sons and also um, Manasseh and Ephraim. So there's some very interesting things there. But when it comes to the separation, if you're going to look at it and you say, Joseph, when are Joseph and Judah separated? And when are they joined together? We would go back to Genesis, right? So in the story of Genesis, um, when you're dealing with uh, uh, back here, Joseph and Right. So when you have Joseph's dreams and Joseph is sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites, which is an important point as well. Um, and it says uh, in verse 26 of Genesis 37. So we know that. Uh, um, right. So they put Joseph in the pit and all that stuff. We all know the story. Um. And it's Judah who says, and Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content. And then there passed by Midianite merchantmen. They drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Now, so we, we see that Judah is the one who suggests the selling of Joseph to the Ishmaelites. Now, when we get to uh, Joseph uh, testing his brothers, right? So they come back. So the joining of the two sticks, um, and there's this whole story dealing with the sacks and putting Benjamin stuff in the sack. But if you get to Genesis 44, 15 or 14, and Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. Now, why is Judah being mentioned here? Isn't he kind of the spokesman for all the brothers? Well, in some ways, yes. Um, I'm not sure particularly why, because he's not the oldest. But it says, and Joseph said unto them, what deed is it that ye have done? What ye not, that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are thy, my Lord's servants. Behold we, and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near to him and said, O oh my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. <clears throat> thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And we, we said unto my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, except your youngest brother come down with you, he shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down. For if our youngest brother, youngest brother be with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bare two sons, and one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since, and so forth. So you keep going on with this story. So Judah is telling this story, and um, let me get to 45. And uh, so anyway, there was, there's something I'm missing. I'm trying to remember where this goes. So anyway, Joseph is going um, to, yeah. yeah it was uh, Judah who suggested 
to the brothers to, to rather than slay Joseph, they should sell him to the Ishmaelites. Right. And so that's so which I read. So we had Judah is the one who um, didn't want him sold to the Ishmaelites. Yeah, it's 30, chapter 37. Yeah, which I read. So I read that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And um, there's another part to this story. Um, um, I just don't know where it is. They left Simeon behind. Um, but anyway, uh, there's something I'm missing. I can't remember what it is. But the point is, we have Judah, who's the spokesman here in this situation. And Judah's the one who sold uh, Joseph into slavery. So when would the separation of the two sticks would happen when Judah suggests that Joseph be sold into slavery and he goes to the Ishmaelites? So when is the joining of the two sticks? That's when uh, the seventy or with the father Jacob come back, come down to to Egypt and uh, they meet Joseph. Right. So so it's connected with this whole event of Ju Joseph's brothers coming to meet him and that whole story. So it's it's actually a bit involved. It's not just like one day the two sticks are joined. I mean Judah comes there. Um, you know. The brothers go back. Simeon's the one that's found. And when they come back uh, with, with Benjamin, then, uh, you know, Joseph says, go get your, your father, go get my father and, and everybody and bring them here to Egypt. So the joining of the two sticks happens sort of in a, it's in stages. Um, and, and it goes from the time that Joseph is 17 to the time that he's 39 this period of 22 years uh, that happens from the time that he separated from his brother, the same year that he has the two dreams and um, that he gets the coat and, and all those things happen. They get sold to the Ishmaelites. And then 22 years later, the joining of the two sticks occurs. So, so that's the first mention of the two sticks. And that's why in Ezekiel chapter 37, when it deals with the joining of the two sticks, it's, it's going to go back to that, that history of Joseph and Judah, right? So it's not going to um, uh, go to, uh, even though it's related to what happens with Jeroboam and Rehoboam, it's actually going back to the original il illustration of these two sticks. And this is an important point uh, because one of the things that we can do with the two 2520s is we can connect them back to the story of Joseph and to the chiasm of the 430 years and the, the chiasm of Joseph himself. So we can tie that all together with the other 2520s. Now this was first done by um, um, Johannes Koletsky. So um, he was a, a German, I believe, who wrote about this back in 2010. I have a paper of his from April of 2010 where he talks about uh, not not as in much detail as I'm I'm talking about it here, but where he takes the story of Joseph and creates this prophetic mirror. He doesn't connect it chronologically with the two twenty five twenties, but he uses it to illustrate the two twenty five twenties. So it's another way to present the twenty five twenty is to go to the story of Joseph itself, and to and to take this. Now, once I worked out the chronology. In 2016, Stephen and I, Stephen suggested I counted backwards. So we'd taken what Joseph Koletsky had done. And when we counted backwards, we came to the prophetic mirror that um, is the story of Joseph. So that was extremely profound that we could do that. But the point that I'm, I'm trying to make here, so there's a number of points. But when we start to deal with the joining of the two sticks, as we're going to see when we study this on 
on next Monday, next Monday morning. Um, and we start to go through and lay this out in a bit more detail, uh, both where Ezekiel is placing this. So one of the things is we can see that Ezekiel is placing this at a certain point, And that's what we're going to have to try to understand because we always already dealt with the resurrection. And now we're going to have the joining of the two sticks. And the one thing that we haven't done in this movement is we haven't put the joining of the two sticks beyond where we, where Jeff has placed it, which is prior to the Sunday law at, at the image of the beast test. Um, but that we can see what it's at ultimately referring to. And, and that's one of the things that, um, one of the insights, I guess, that we get as we start to study into Ezekiel more, we can see that we can apply the, the joining of the two sticks at the image of the beast test, just like we can take um, the, the Valley of Dry Bones and place it at 9-11, right? So we can do that. But in Ezekiel, he's actually placing these later in history than we have. So, um, so it, to me, it's extremely profound. I mean, I, you know, I haven't met, wrapped my mind around it completely all. Um, I haven't worked out all the details. But as we look at what we've done with Ezekiel so far, we know where Ezekiel is at. And, and so this really, really does help our understanding of, of this movement. A any final thoughts on that? So I know that we're going to have a lot to do with the joining of the two sticks. There's going to be more diagrams and uh, illustrations of these things. A any final thoughts? Time for more study. <laughs> yes, a lot more study. There. Yeah, trying to figure out what to study right now is a little bit difficult because there's all these different lines and different things that we're studying. You know, we're studying Daniel chapter 11, we're studying the book of Esther, um, we're studying Ezekiel, and then we're studying all these other issues uh, that are connected to them. So, <clears throat> Uh, I do think that everybody should read that paper I sent by Derek and uh, Williams. It's it, the nice thing about it, uh, you know, because this was on WhatsApp that he posted this this letter. Um, you know, it's well written, it's well organized and well thought out. And, you know, and I've sort of known him a little bit on Facebook and I've seen him here and there um, on, uh, you know, WhatsApp. But it's very insightful in, in, in going over this past history, going returning to the old past, looking at what we understood. Things just jump out at us that we wouldn't have noticed at the time. And, and, and that's why it's so important to go over our teaching of our past history, not just way back in Millerite history, but even within this movement. Okay, so... Any other final questions or thoughts? Because we're going to close with prayer right away. I just put a little thing in the chat there about, about Joseph and the testing and, and the reunification and all the chapter numbers. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. So there's Zechariah 913. Yeah, so that's uh, when I bent, when I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. In, so yes, in this passage, could this two sticks represent a bow and an arrow? Oh, th th yeah, there's actually some interesting things about a bow and an arrow. Uh, and I can't remember, I was just reading it. But it was talking about the bow in the left hand shall fall and, and the arrow in the right hand. Um, so let me just see if I can find that.
know where this was. Yeah, I'm going to have to find this. Where was I reading this? Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, Mark. Um, this is the table weird, weird, um, we're at, at the deep one we have a lunch break, God is such a speak to me. Okay. Uh, in my heart, he said, he gave me a last warning of my age. It is close, be done. Okay. We'll get we we'll go home. So Jesus is coming back soon. Is that what you're saying? Um, he did say about my my age. It is almost done. He will me get get ready for him to uh, pick me up, take me home. Okay. Ezekiel 39.3. Yeah, yeah, yeah I just found it. Yeah, so Ezekiel 39.3. So, um, and so this is interesting. Um, and, and, and I say it's interesting. There's a number of reasons why it's interesting. Because um, we're going to get to this part. But I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. And... Um, there's something about this left and right hand. We've addressed it a little bit in Ezekiel because we know it rep represents north and south, right? So right, the right. left hand is um, is the north and the right hand is the south, or is it the other way around? Um, let me see, I have to look up the word again. Yeah, the left hand is the north and the right hand is the south, contrary to what we used to think. Right, south yeah. Paul meaning yeah, right. So it's the opposite of South Paul. Yeah, so the left hand is the north and the right hand is the south. Now, when you go back to the blessing of Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, which I'm not going to go to right now, we maybe look at this uh, on Monday. Remember that he crosses his hands, right? Uh, so when he blesses right. them, instead of putting... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, remember. Um, <laughs> I want to look at this now. <laughs> I, 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 I want to look at this now. Okay. But I not be here on my Monday. Okay, so okay. let's look at this. So this is Genesis 48. And it came to pass after this, these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee, and Israel strengthened himself, and sat upon his bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and blessed me. And he said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, etc. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon. They shall be mine. And thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff here, which I'm just going to uh, skip over. But um, uh, now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, verse 10, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God has showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, 
and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought it near unto him. And Israel stretched out, or Jacob, stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands winningly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life unto this day. Um, you know, so he talks about this blessing. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his fathers refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall, shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless thee, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. So there's, there's something about this, this left and the right hand being guided um, by God in contrary to what you would expect um, that I, I, I don't have, you know, full understanding on. But there's something about that left and right hand that we need to go back to this story uh, and understand. Uh, that's all I'm saying. So anyway, we're going to close with prayer. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time we had to study here this morning. We ask for your continued blessing in our studies. And we pray that uh, as we uh, go through the rest of this week, uh, that you can um, guide us, direct us, help us to learn and grow. And we pray that the Sabbath, which will be coming tomorrow evening, uh, that we will be ready for it. We pray for the studies that we'll have on the Sabbath as well. And um, we know, Lord, there's many things that we need to learn. And so we give our hearts to you and uh, ask that you can be with each person. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>